Welcome everybody to a brand new Blu-ray and DVD out and about video today. And this week sees the release of the horror reboot Wrong Turn, hitting store shelves along with the animated adventure sequel The Crude's New Age. And Warner Archive Collection is releasing a Blu-ray edition of the 1990 coming-of-age teen drama Pump up the volume. So damn good. <laughs> Plus much, much more. So let's go see the deals, exclusives, and we are at our first location, Walmart. So let's go in and see what they got. All right, we are in at Walmart, and I am seeing they have this really... Nice display for the Crudes, new age, man. Look at that. It's been a little bit since we've actually seen a display over at this Walmart, man. Something interesting worth seeing this week? That's for damn sure. Hmm. They got the DVD of the Crudes, the new age for $17.96. They do have the Blu-ray DVD digital for $22.96. They have that. They also end up having this exclusive limited edition gift set only at Walmart for $24.96. Now this comes with the movie, a water bottle, and a 35 beast puzzle. Woo! And you are getting your money's worth with, with, with this set. Damn. The puzzle and the water bottle. All for $24.96. Damn. They're going all out with, with them crudes. <laughs> very, very nice one for the kitties out there. They can enjoy their water and their puzzle while watching the movie. Sounds fun, right? <laughs> sure, why not? And that they also have this two movie collection as well for the first movie and the second movie. Uh, I don't know what price this one is. I'm assuming it's close to $22.96 or $24, somewhere around there, but I don't know exactly the price of that one. But I got a chance to watch The Crude's A New Age on Amazon Prime, and I guess I was kind of looking forward to it. I mean, I kind of was. I mean, I remember watching the first movie and honestly really enjoying it. I thought it was, I thought it was fun. It's goofy funny kind of slapstick ish humor for the kids it was a good mindless entertainment fun for the kids it wasn't like a movie that i think like adults can enjoy as well as kids as far as like adult humor is concerned in there it's mostly a mainly sort of kids animated movie that had some goofy stuff and maybe you know they have the the beautiful colors and you know keep kids occupied for an hour and a half or so and maybe it's something that the adults can kind of just maybe watch it as well keep their mind off of things kind of movie like that man wasn't anything amazing but it wasn't terrible either i i enjoyed it for what it was the the colorful characters the goofy situations that, that kind of stuff so i figured okay why not do a sequel it kind of makes sense man and it's actually kind of weird because the sequel came out last year, and it's weird because the first Crudes movie came out in 2013, which is kind of nuts if you really think about it, because 2013 all the way to 2020, that's a long time for an animated sequel. You usually don't wait that long, but with this, well, apparently you did. But was it worth it? So... Basically, in a nutshell, it's the prehistoric family again, and they meet up with this new fam family, and basically, they're just a whole different in so many ways, and it's basically sort of the complications of meeting up with another family, and oh, who's the better family, and who's the better this, and who's the better dad, and, and who has the better pets, and, and you know kind of almost like competition like but sort of goofy comedy for the kids I would say and and it's all kind of complications and funny situations and you name it all that kind of stuff I mean to be honest with you guys 
I will say this much. The movie is not revolutionary in its comedy by any means. But it's got really great, colorful, vibrant characters to it. The color palette is, like, really, like, all over the place. Like, it's almost like a rainbow splashed onto the screen, man. And kids are going to get, like, lost in the colors big time. I like the design of the creatures. And I like the design of the characters. And the sort of prehistoric landscape. I mean, there's a lot of great stuff there for the kids in general that I think really works. And it's a good time waster. There is some jokes that might go over kids' heads. Things that they're like, wait a minute, what are the two fathers fighting about? Like, like uh, for a five-year-old, like, they wouldn't get any of that crap, dude. They would just like, huh? Like, mom and dad, they're fighting. Why are they fighting? And, then, you know, it's, it's, trying to explain that to kids is like, yeah, that's like a non-starter, man. But I got to admit, as far as, like, an animated sequel goes for the kids and the family it's a pretty decent one like I said, it's not the best animated sequel of all time there's ones that are way way better but as far as a good like hour and a half time waster for kids with with a lot of great like splashy colors and goofy characters honestly it's not so bad and i will say this much the animation is gorgeous here i mean they do a great job with the animation Sometimes for these sequels, maybe they don't go all out, especially for something like The Croods, where you're like, really? You're going to go all out for, you know, the animation of The Croods? But the first one had great animation, and I got to give it to this because the animation is gorgeous here as well. I'm not a big fan of animation overall, some of these animated movies. Some I like better than others. I don't know if this type of animated movie is technically my thing, truth be told, but I'll be honest for the hour and a half I had fun with it and I think in general I think kids will as well that's what I think man I like the cover though again very vibrant very colorful it's definitely going to catch kids eyes in a big bad way but that's kind of part of the marketing of it because you kind of want the kids to be like mommy 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 I have cruise new age new age and, and they'll be like oh it's seventeen ninety six worth it for an hour and a half of time that I can do other things <laughs> and I'd say so yeah I would I would definitely say so guys and a nice little only a Walmart exclusive a kids water bottle and a puzzle hmm we've seen some interesting exclusives in the past from Walmart are kids really into water bottles and puzzles especially the age that people are watching crudes I'd be curious on that one, guys. <laughs> I don't know. When I was when I was much much y younger, like the time when I would watch these type of animated movies, I don't know if I was into water bottles and puzzles. But it's a new age. Kids are different, so maybe they are now. Be kind of weird though. <laughs> Not bad selection so far. Very interesting. And boy, it's been a while since we've seen one of these displays, man. Not half bad. Hmm. And the movie, I would say, is definitely worth it for kids. Not so bad. Let's see what else Walmart's got. And over in the main section for most of the new releases, not a ton more to check out, but a little bit they, they still have over here. They do have that two movie collection and it is $22.96. The Blu-ray digital for the two movie collection is $27.96. And they also in this section have the 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray Digital for $27.96 as well. So they do have all the varieties. The 4K, the Blu-ray, the DVD, the two-movie collection. Freaking exclusive limited edition gift set. Like, Walmart went all out with the crudes, the new age, man. They definitely did, man. Wow. Can't say they don't have enough of that, because they definitely do, man. They also have this original Scooby-Doo movie, The Sword and the Scoob, for $14.96. What is this? I love that cover. Zoinks! <laughs> oh, Scooby-Doo, man. Mystery Inc. goes medieval. Yes! Take a journey back in time to King Arthur's Court and this legendary saga of wizards, knights, dragons, and Scooby-Doo. 
An evil sorceress tries to seize power in Camelot, so Peter needs help. He needs their help, really? Okay. Oh, their valiant efforts only make things royally worse. Are ready to dig in. Oh, oh, good lord. All the Camelot hilarity? <laughs> okay. You know, why didn't King Arthur just you know, ask Merlin? God, if I had to pick between who was going to help me if I was King Arthur, Merlin or Scooby and Shaggy? I'd probably pick Merlin, just saying. I mean, I love Scooby. I mean, and, you know, dude is all kinds of fun. The Snooby snacks, the Scooby snacks are cool, and I'm not gonna lie, you could probably get high with Scooby too and have a hell of a good time. <laughs> so, I mean, there's a lot of hilarity there, but the quicker path would probably be Merlin, just saying, man. Wow, man, they, they go back to medieval times to help out King Arthur and the sword. Man, it's got to be fun. I'm not going to lie, man. I always like these these sort of cartoon adventures where they go in different time periods and they try to like solve like crimes or stuff within within that era. It's all just kind of playing on the hilarity of the situation and the ridiculousness of it. I like that. I really do, man. I don't know. This could be fun. This could be really cool, man. And and in the original Scooby Doo movie, look, any new original Scooby Doo you gotta love. So, uh, medieval Scooby, it's interesting, but it could be a hell of a lot of fun. And then I'm seeing they have the DVD digital of Redemption Day for twelve ninety six. Hmm. Nice, very patriotic. I like that cover. Not bad. Ernie Hudson and Andy Garcia. Straight to DVD love for those two gentlemen. Okay, what is this? Taking his wife was their last mistake. Alright. Having just returned home, decorated U.S. Marine Captain Brad Paxson. Wife, Kate, is kidnapped by a terrorist group working in Morocco for a daring and deadly operation to save the woman he loves. Yeah. Don't, don't fuck with a man and his pussy. <laughs> Oh, well, that's, yeah, that's pretty, pretty much the truth. I ain't gonna lie, guys. Wow, man. You know, I'm looking at this synopsis, and I'm not gonna lie, it it sounds exactly like The Marine, or one of the Marine movies. I mean, seriously, it's like eerily similar to one of the Marine films. Like, almost they took the same synopsis and just made a, just a slightly different movie with a different name, and that's it, man. Damn. Like, they were copying The Marine big time. I mean, I love Andy Garcia, I love Ernie Hudson. You don't see Ernie Hudson as much as you should, man, but he's really good. It could be a good movie. I mean, I like The Marine, and it seems like it's literally just straight out of the same playbook, so it could be cool, actually. It might be interesting. Hmm. And they also have The Last Vermeer for 1496 with Guy Pierce. Deception is a fine art. I like that cover. Almost actually kind of looks like a painting, weirdly enough. Hmm. While Joseph Piller, a Dutch Jew, was fighting in the resistance during the Second World War, the Woody Devonair art connoisseur Hans van Mergen was hosting hedonistic soirees and selling Dutch. So it becomes an investigator. Oh, that's an interesting synopsis. I'm not going to lie. That's really very fascinating, man. You know what this movie kind of reminds me of? Not exactly, but it kind of reminds me of Monuments Men. Because that, that, that's a really great movie about, about that sort of group of people coming together to protect like the art that was being destroyed by the Nazis and protecting it. This is much in the same way, but it's a little bit more different than that where they're actually hunting this guy down and trying to like convict him of crimes that he might not actually have done. Very fascinating stuff, man. Hmm. And I always love these fascinating stories from World War II. I've said that time and time again, but it really is true, and I love the fascination of that of you know you have the main big war stuff with the nazis and and the allies but there's so much more that went on and all these 
different unique stories, these side tales that happened all along the, the time period of the World War II timeline is just fascinating to me, man. Truly is. Hmm. This does look pretty decent, actually, just from the synopsis alone. And I, I love Guy Pierce, man. Guy Pierce is awesome. This doesn't look half bad, dude. Hmm. This is one might be worth diving into sometime. Definitely looks like something up my alley. Definitely will have to check that one out, guys. Other than that, that seems to be it. I mean, some indies, little Scooby Doo medieval love, and a hell of a lot of crude new age, man. They definitely went all out with that release. That's for damn sure. Not half bad this week over at Walmart, dare I say. Pretty happy. All right. Let's head out. Two weeks in a row, guys. Two weeks in a row. I'm not calling it a trend yet, because it's not a trend. However, come on. In two weeks of most of the new releases, or at least a lot of stuff to check out. Hey, hey, I'm a happy man. I'm a happy physical media lover. Just saying, can this like continue constantly? I'd like to say I have hope, but this is Walmart. And I'm not gonna like get overly excited, but just saying, I'm, I'm happy, man. It looks like they're actually putting stuff out and damn glad for it, man. I really am, dude. And they definitely went all out. I mean, man, God, man, so much crudes. Jesus, the display and the uh, the gift set, and damn, man. And they definitely are in love, love with that prehistoric family. That's damn sure. Wow. Whew. But some good stuff here, like Indie Love, Animated Original Movie, Big re Release and Display. Yeah, this week, they definitely delivered, dare I say, man. And I was shocked. Not sure what I was expecting this week, but they came through in a big, bad way. At least I thought so. Hope you did, too. Let's hope this trend keeps rolling along, shall we? Let's hope for not next week. Fingers crossed. You never know, but please, Lord, physical media gods, you listening? Let's keep it rolling. Let's hope, guys. All right, let's head to the next location and see more of that physical media goodness. All right, everybody, we are at our second location, Target. But before we go in, I got to talk to you guys about something. It's not really an article or anything. I was noticing on Facebook, I'm a part of a lot of these movie groups, which are great. A lot of people post some really wonderful articles and talk about a lot of different physical media and their thoughts. Great groups, man. And somebody was really pissed about that 2020 movie, Greyhound starring Tom Hanks, that is now an Apple exclusive. Because there is no physical media release in sight for Greyhound at all. So for the foreseeable future, that movie is only going to be an Apple exclusive. And this person was really, really pissed about it. And, you know, under the comment sections, they were talking about that movie uh, with Steve Carell, Beautiful Boy, that I believe went to Amazon Prime. And that has not gotten any sort of physical media release outside of Canada, which they had to import it through Canada in order to even have the movie on physical. And I was thinking about this. You know, the, the more and more this pandemic happened, and the more and more we really got into the thick of it, you notice that a lot of movie studios sold off a lot of movies to these streaming services, you know, to make some money. They really didn't know what was going to happen, if movie theaters were even going to still survive. And so they were just, hey, man, we're going to wholesale. We're going to throw a bunch of these movies at these companies. They'll buy them. We'll get some revenue from it. Everything should be all set. The problem is, is that I'm sure there's contracts. I'm sure there's all kinds of conditions and maybe one of them is like we have exclusive rights for x amount of years if not forever which means that that movie or property may only ever get a digital release and will not get a physical release whatsoever that's interesting guys that's truly interesting man because you know i don't mind digital Yes, I have my issues with it, but I don't ultimately mind digital. As long as you can say, we're going to put out all the options here. 
If it's on digital, it ought to eventually be on physical to give everybody a chance to buy it if they so choose to. But now with this, and you'll notice, you know, yes, the Disney Plus stuff will eventually get releases. I truly believe the HBO Max stuff will get releases eventually. But there's a lot of original content on Netflix that still hasn't gotten a legal physical release. You'll see a lot of bootleg copies out there, but nothing legal. I believe the same thing's going to happen with the Apple service. Movies like Greyhound and some other stuff, even some other TV shows, I don't think you'll ever see any of that stuff come to physical whatsoever. I mean, even... Even there's talk of, like, maybe Mandalorian not coming on physical or even something like WandaVision. And the problem is, is that these digital services, they depend on subscription services. And so to them, it makes no sense to put it on physical because they would lose a subscription. Why would we get rid of it and put it on physical and have people just wait for the physical release when they can pay the money month in and month out over and over and over again to continue to to watch it. Why would we ever give them an option of physical for them to actually own the damn thing? That's what you're going to see a lot more, guys. And it's a real shame because it comes down to rights issues and it comes down to, you know, certain contracts and it really sucks because it's no longer about a director's intention or if a star really thinks it's worth putting on physical or, you know, the actual company that made the damn film. No, it's not about that anymore. It's about streaming. It's about the digital platform. And if they do not see a need to put it on physical, they're just not going to do it which honestly spells a lot of trouble for a lot of these newer films going on these digital sites. I mean, I love to see these new films getting a platform, getting out there into the world, but if it means losing the physical media rights and not getting any release whatsoever, or having to import it for major amounts of money, or even have to buy the bootleg of the damn thing, I just don't think it's right. I honestly don't, guys. You know, at the end of the day, I always thought that a movie or a TV series needs to go to the widest audience possible. And yes, I do believe that everyone has to be on digital, but I also believe that everything that's digital has to be on physical as as well. Because there's a lot of people out there that just don't want to spend the money for these digital platforms. They just can't afford it. You know, they need to pay for bills. They need to eat. They need to have a roof over their heads. And a lot of these digital, you know, platforms are raising their prices more and more. And you'll see it continue over the next, you know, year or so. It's just going to continue over and over again. So I've always said you you need every avenue for people to want to have it. And there's just a lot of people who will never find these movies, some of these newer films that are really worth it because there's just no physical release and they just will never find these things. And it's a real damn shame, guys. It it honestly is, man. So for me, I just find it really disheartening and I understand the person's frustration 110% because, you know, to me... That's why physical media is so important to me because I own it. I'm not I'm not in the hands of these digital companies that want to exploit me for X amount of money. Yeah, I'll pay for the service, but if I'm done with the service for the time being, I'm out. I don't want to have to depend on them over and over and over again. And that's what they want. That's what they truly want from from us, man. And so You know, it's fine to say digital is great and you like digital, but you got to understand that you can't take digital and then screw over the fans of physical. Both have to work together. And if companies aren't doing that, then we definitely need to push back on them. That's just my honest opinion, guys. I mean, I definitely want to know what you think about this, but it is kind of disheartening to see that even, even a movie that has a popular actor like Tom Hanks on a digital platform 
may never see the light of day on physical. That's just crazy to me. It honestly is, man. But definitely let me know about that, guys. As far as this week, not a huge, gigantic, plentiful week exactly. But Walmart proved you could still show off quite a bit of media. So I'm very curious as what Target will have. Well, I guess the only way to find out is to head inside. So let's give it a go. All right, we are in at Target. And it looks a little slow over in the physical media section. I mean, there's a, a lot of releases over here, but a lot of stuff from last week. The only major new things I'm seeing is they have The Crudes, A New Age, and they have a lot of stuff here, man. They have the DVD for $17.99. They have the Blu-ray DVD digital for $22.99. The 4K for $27.99. They also have that Blu-ray digital of the two-movie collection of both The Crudes and the sequel for $27.99. And they also have this only at Target exclusive Blu-ray DVD digital for $24.99. Not really anything different as far as the actual like artwork is concerned or anything, but it does come with a 40-page filmmaker gallery book. That's usually Target's thing. They usually do a lot of these gallery books anyways. So another exclusive for the Crudes, A New Age. This is definitely the exclusive heavy week for Crudes. That's for damn sure, man. Well, it's nice for them to see not another exclusive. Maybe you guys are into the filmmaker gallery books. If you are, Target is definitely the way to go, dare I say, man. So... This is DreamWorks, and DreamWorks has done a bunch of animated series of movies, man. Uh, How to Train Your Dragon, Shrek, Madagascar, you name it. They've done, they've done a lot of stuff, man. And the thing about with, with animated movies and the children's market is that it's so vast... I mean, honestly, it really is. I mean, it honestly is a pretty damn cutthroat business. I mean, everybody is vying for your money. Everybody is wanting a little piece of the pie. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about DreamWorks or, or Disney, uh, Illumination, and many, many, many others. It really is tough to sort of stand out within the children's and animated market because there's just so much product out there that it's easy to kind of get drowned out a little bit and with the crudes i was kind of wondering whether crudes was actually a big enough franchise whether it was like like had a big enough following to it but it's kind of interesting guys because i'm going to show something over here which I was kind of looking at earlier, and it's this, The Crudes Ultimate Collection, which has The Crudes Movie plus Dawn of the Crudes, which is seasons one through four. I didn't even know, truth be told, I didn't even know that there was actually a Crudes animated TV show. I didn't even know that was a thing. So that's kind of interesting to me, man. I mean, the animation is not nearly as good as the movies. I mean, that's for damn sure. Look at that. Woo! Yeah, that's a major step down. Holy shit. Wow, man. But it must have been popular. I mean, they got the TV s series and everything. So, I mean, it must be a big enough property. But I'm kind of curious, is it, when is it, like, so watered down? I mean, you know what I mean? It's It's kind of interesting because, you know, looking over here and everything the dreamworks collection of stuff in the kung fu panda madagascar shrek how to train your dragon it kind of feels like all those series at some point got really watered down like the shrek movies like the first two were really great maybe i'd even give you the third one kind of but it, it felt like they were just over exploiting the series too much and i think the same thing with madagascar they went way overboard with the madagascar films kung fu panda i don't think has really been as drawn out but still still is very very popular still a lot of stuff to exploit with that series 
the only series I think within the DreamWorks catalog, maybe outside of the Crudes, which to me still really feels very vibrant and still feels like like they can do some really great stories, is How to Train Your Dragon. Like How to Train Your Dragon is still to this day the three movies plus a lot of the short films and the the show it still feels like there's a lot of great stories and and it feels like it's kind of the crown jewel in some ways of the dreamworks animation or at least it's become that way which is kind of really interesting to me with something like the cruise and new age I think it's a good movie. I think it's a solid film for kids. I think they're going to have a lot of fun with it. I think the colors are bright and and they're splashing all over the screen. I think the kids will be like very into the, the, the movie. I think it's something for the whole family to enjoy. As long as the kids enjoy it, the parents will. It's goofy fun. Is it a memorable dreamworks animated movie series i don't know if it really is i mean compared to how to train your dragon or even the first few shrek movies i don't know if the cruise is really like the most memorable franchise i don't know like when i watched the movie it's good i enjoyed it but i didn't know if like i would remember it like like for for a long time like the shrek movies i continue to remember the how to train your dragon movies i continue to remember but some of the other ones, not so much. But like I said, the animation world is such a cutthroat business that you just got to just keep putting product out there like crazy to, to feed these little kids. And, you know, there's always more little kids. There's always new product to put out and continue to explore. And so do you have time to really make something really memorable and excellent and take your time with it anymore? I mean, some studios do. Do, can DreamWorks really afford to do that or can they just put the product out there and hope to God that it gains a lot of money? I mean, truth be told, the Crudes last year did make a decent amount of money at the box office with the pandemic going on and everything. So there is a hunger for this. I just don't know whether these films become like superficial at a certain point or whether they'll be memorable enough people will remember them like 10, 20 years from now. I just don't know about that, guys. It's just become such a factory now that you just got to pump the product out there, be down to, you know, what, what, whatever, you know, what, whether it's good or not, you just got to put it out there for people to, you know, basically consume now. That's what it's become. I'm kind of curious as to what you guys think about that. Very, very, very interesting. I, the movie's good. I like it. And I think kids are going to have a lot of fun with it. But at the end of the day, I can't say that it's one of my favorite animated movies that I've ever seen, though. Fun goofy fun but mm, anything past that not sure but i will say this much though the animation is wonderful and dreamworks put a lot of effort in, in, into it whether it's memorable or not you gotta at least say the animation is amazing so there is that i'm kind of curious what you guys think about that but other than that that seems to be it i mean a crap ton of the crew that we saw over at walmart and now here too other than that not much else to show off. Most of the same stuff we've seen before. But hey, something is better than uh, than nothing. And uh, like I said, a lot of selection of the Cruise New Age and exclusive. Not half bad. All right. Decent, I suppose. Hey, we knew Tari was going to carry a lot of Cruise. So there you have it. All right. Let's head out. Yeah, it is a bit of a slow release week here compared to like last week, which we saw a lot of stuff. This week, not nearly as plentiful, and as I've always told you guys, usually that means that Target ain't carrying a hell of a lot, and right yet again. I mean, at least they have the big major release this week, which is Crude and an exclusive, so they kind of saved it. I mean, we still haven't seen the Wrong Turn reboot yet. I thought maybe we'd see it over at the first Walmart, but that was a no-go. And I thought maybe Target, but then I was like, oh, Wrong Turn is like one of those really grisly horror movies. And yeah, that's totally not Target's thing, man. They're more of like, they're more like, hey, bright, colorful 
prehistoric family going on adventures, not in the woods, people getting killed brutally. And, you know, yeah, that's totally not Target's thing. <laughs> Bob, may, maybe they might, you know, change their mind, but yeah, that was totally a no-go, guys. That's for damn sure, but hey, you know, uh, worth a try, I guess. But, yeah, at least they had something. And sometimes with Target, let's be honest, something is better than nothing. And, hey, one big new release for Target... Yes, I'll take it, especially with an, an exclusive. Not half bad, guys. I mean, all things considered, but hope you guys enjoyed it. The one release that we got to see. Let's hope we end up finding some more physical media at the next location. All right, everybody. We are at our third location, the second Walmart. I'm going to go in and check out if there's any interesting indie titles worth diving into. If there is, I'm going to head back to Film Fan 108 HQ and show it off to you guys but before i do that i gotta talk about a movie trailer with you guys and that is none other than disney's cruella yes oh this one this one was definitely something i had heard about i knew it was happening and it was actually i believe supposed to come out last year but coronavirus, pandemic, all that jazz, yeah, we'll get it eventually this year. It says somewhere around, I believe May, if I'm not mistaken, we'll probably get the movie, but it's been something that's on my radar because I do love 101 Dalmatians. It's a movie that I loved when I was a kid. I grew up with it. I grew up with the live-action movie. I grew up with Glenn Close being a great Cruella in the live action film loved her in that movie and so I'm like okay we're doing a standalone movie of Cruella seeing her development into the iconic villain that she becomes I suppose and we're here now these movies this is what we have now I mean actually we've been here for a while because we've seen Maleficent and Maleficent was really the starting of going down a path of reevaluating the villain and perhaps seeing their point of view, their side of the coin, and that maybe they weren't just all evil for evil's sake, maybe they had a little bit more of a complex side to them, and that is where Cruella comes in. And I gotta admit, man, like, from the trailer... Like, this is very much like Harley Quinn. Like, I don't know if any of you guys really got that vibe, but I was looking at the trailer, and I'm like, wow, like, this is basically Disney's version of Harley Quinn, man. I mean, some of the lines felt so Harley Quinn. The the look of of Emma Stone here looks straight out of Harley Quinn. But there's a lot of images here and imagery that almost feels like straight out of a Tim Burton movie as well. Like, I've gotten, like, from this trailer, major Tim Burton vibes and major Harley Quinn vibes as well, man. I mean, it's it's definitely a mixture where, you know, from the trailer alone, I can see that she's not exactly completely the villain, but out of certain circumstances, she turns into the villain and I think Emma Stone looks like she's having a really fun time with the role, really diving into the devious side of Cruella, which is really, really cool, which looks awesome to me. I like the design. I like how she's, like, solely going mad and crazy. I like how she's underestimated at first, but yet people start to really start to, ooh, this, this is a one badass chick, man. Like, eventually within in the trailer. I don't know how all the story fits together, how they're actually going to connect Cruella's journey with the 101 Dalmatians. We see Dalmatians in the actual trailer itself, so obviously there's a fascination there that she has with them. You know, I know a lot of people, honestly, are a little bit sort of half and half when it comes to Maleficent. Some people really liked the idea of Maleficent and it's showing a much more complex character, not so black and white. But a lot of people really didn't like the fact that they made Maleficent sympathetic and felt like that took away from the original story. I don't know how they're going to pull it off here. Are they going to go very sympathetic and then dive into the evil stuff? Are they just, is, is, was she always evil and, 
you know, it just kind of, uh, kind of unlocked in her brain. Like, I don't know, but like I said, there's a lot of female empowerment stuff here that I'm seeing. There's a lot of Harley Quinn that I'm definitely seeing. Like this movie feels very influenced by by like Harley Quinn stories. I'm curious to see how this all fits together. I like Emma Stone as an actress. She's a really great actress. I've liked a lot of the stuff she's done. But can she really compete with a Glenn Close from the original live-action movie of 101 Dalmatians? Is she even trying that? Or is this going to be a whole different thing and she's just going to do her own spin on it? I'm very curious on, on this one. You know, I, I love a lot of Disney movies. The live-action ones have been hit and miss for me, but... This isn't a remake or a reboot. It's a different animal altogether. So I'm very curious to see how it all fits. I'm wondering what you guys think of this. Definitely let me know. In the meantime, well, very curious to see if Walmart will have anything worth checking out. Let's head in and check out the second Walmart goodness. And I am in at the second Walmart, guys. And... Even though it's a little bit of a slightly lesser release week, I'm still finding at least a few things here at this second Walmart that we have not seen yet. Some of the bigger name releases and some indie love as well. And maybe a surprise or two as, as well. You know how the second Walmart rolls, and even on a lesser week, we can still find stuff that is definitely worth checking out indeed. So, alright, not half bad. A little physical media love to give a look to. So, Seth, let's check out that physical media, brother. Oh, you know, brother, you know how I roll. Of course I am going to show off the physical media. Come on, that's what I do. I'm a physical media lover. Think I'm not gonna show up the physical media? Come on, man. You know me better than that, Seth. Yes, I will take care of you, brother. Of course I will, man. And I'll take care of you guys as well, showing off the physical media. And just goes to show you that not every week clearly is going to be very plentiful. However, that does not mean that we cannot find good media. It just means that we have to go digging a little bit more than normal. I don't mind a little bit of digging. I hope you guys don't e either. And that's why physical media is great sometimes, though, isn't it? Because, yeah, sometimes it's a little bit frustrating when you can't find what you want. But when you dig hard enough, you will find a gem or two hidden among the pile. And I think... I think the stuff that we got from Walmart this time around is pretty good, guys. Dare I say, not a lot, but what's here is definitely worth the discussion. Oh, you know what time it is. Yes, indeed. It is Walmart goodness. <laughs> of course it is, man. And a few titles definitely worth giving a look to, dare I say. And the first title we got is Silk Road. Very nice. Gotta love that. A mastermind is a terrible thing to waste. Very true indeed. Jason Clark, Nick Robinson. Silk Road. I like that cover, man. Very nice. Hmm. Now... I got a chance to watch this on Amazon Prime, and I was actually kind of intrigued by it. The story alone, really fascinating to me, man. And basically, it's about this young guy played by Nick Robinson who is somebody that doesn't really like authority, that doesn't really care for authority, and sort of the man making the rules of government, so to speak, and he loves drugs. And he realizes, well, why not actually, like, put a free marketplace on the internet for people to buy drugs whenever they want? Okay, so here we go, running, and this is what he does. On the flip side of that, you have Jason Clark, who plays his agent, who has been sort of d disgraced and and sort of is following him and maybe trying to catch him. And it's sort of a little bit of a cat and mouse game, but at the same time, it's more about 
this whole idea of this social network of drug traffickers that are going through this site. And it's really extremely fascinating. And what I didn't realize is that this is based on a true story, which is wild to me. You know, when this was going on, they started out around like 2000, 2009, somewhere around there, 2008, 2009. And you know, it's it's kind of really interesting because if you really look back at even just then, it's still almost the, the wild world of the internet at that point. I mean, truly, it is. The idea that there's not a lot that's really being regulated, the idea that the internet is really new at that point. And the idea that you can actually get away with a hell of a lot more than maybe you would even nowadays, man. I mean, just the the regulations that are in place now are certainly some of the things that weren't even there back in the day. And so it's wild to think that this was as true of a story as it is. I mean, I don't know if I would have ever even really heard about this back in the day... I wasn't really paying attention to major news stories as I am now. I certainly don't do drugs, so I would have never known about any of this stuff, man. And it's extremely fascinating to me. I mean, truly, it's it's such a wild story. And to think that even a small percentage of it could be true is just so wild to me, man. I mean, truly. But I gotta admit... They handled the storytelling really well here. I thought the acting was amazing. Jason Clark was a fantastic, fantastic actor for this piece. Nick Robinson did a really good job as as well. I like the idea of the social media aspect of this and the idea of you know bringing together a, a website for for drug users. It's just really fascinating to me and. And I got to admit, the, the movie that kind of reminds me a lot of this film is The Social Network. I mean, not really in the fact that, you know, obviously we're creating a Facebook here or something, but the idea of, you know, going on the internet and supplying something for people who, who want it, supply and demand, and the complications of it, and the mistrust, and the deception... It's it's really fascinating. And the fact that this young guy was really way in over his head, way more than he could have ever realized, man. And just the idea that he never really knew how crazy it all was going to get. It all just snowballed so quickly and so fast. And even using Bitcoin to his advantage, Bitcoin being very new at that point, and him taking advantage of that and and obviously becoming insanely rich because of it. It's just a wild, true, bizarre story that I'm so glad actually got, got featured in a movie, man. I don't know if many people really know mo much about this movie, Silk Road, but I gotta tell you, man, between the acting and the great storytelling here, I think it's worth at least a look. It's not a perfect movie, you know, there's, well, I should say with any movie that's based off of a true story, right, there's going to be moments where there's a little bit more fictitious than other points. There's going to be times when, to be fair, you're going to have those those moments where it's a little bit over the top. And there's moments when, to be honest with you, they're going to leave out things. Things that would have been really interesting had they kept in, but they didn't. So, I would say, man, that Silk Road is a very unique and interesting movie. Just from the idea of the early times of the internet and the idea of people taking advantage of it the way they did here. And just how much of a wild and crazy story it is. It, it, it is truly a unique film based on just the unique experience of the actual story itself quite interesting man if you're into a very unique and interesting true life tale and great acting alongside it silk road 
it's definitely where it's at. Speaking of great storytelling, Centigrade from IFC Midnight and ho oh, ho some Scream Factory love, baby, yes. Let's get down to this. So I, I saw this on Amazon Prime, okay? And I really didn't know what to expect because I didn't know anything about the actual movie. But I didn't even really know that this is based in some truth to a true story. I'm serious, man. I was I was shocked by that. I did not expect this. Basically, it's about this this couple who is in Norway for this conference and there's this bad winter storm. They stop on the side of the road while while they're driving, of course, sleeping and just waiting until everything blows over. They wake up and they are under mounds and mounds of snow and ice. I mean, their whole car is covered, man. And they can't get out of the car. Seriously, they cannot get out of the car at all. They are trying like crazy. Nothing is budging. It's incredibly cold. They've got very little food. The car won't start. It's And it's just a fight for survival. And that's what the movie is, man. And I got to admit, when I started watching it, I was wondering to myself, I said, wait a minute, this movie is almost an hour and a half. And it's got to last for a long time. How are they going to stretch this thing out? Like, that's what was my biggest worry about this thing. I thought we were gonna, they were going to actually stretch this story out here for that length of time. And I got to admit, I was I was blown away by it, man. I mean, yes, at first it is very slow going. I mean, it's a, it's a slow going film anyways. But it starts out kind of slow. And at first, the main female is kind of annoying, kind of gets on your nerves a little bit and you're wondering i don't know about this like uh like this is early on in the film and already i'm like not really liking where this is going and slowly but surely you get to sympathize with her you get to understand what you know what's really going on the fact that she's pregnant the fact that she could have the kid at any moment and they're stuck here in this situation and the idea that you know when you're in such a life-threatening situation like this you know, your patience is tried, your ability to survive is tried, the idea that your loved one who you have to completely and utterly trust with every fiber of your being, you know, could be the one that, you know, um, might not have your best interest at heart. And it's it's really fascinating stuff, man. I thought the acting was great. This is almost like, you could almost turn this movie into a play, I mean, it's just basically a two-person movie, essentially, inside of this car. And the acting of, like, the fact of, you know, they go from worry to panic to a little bit of hope to desperation, you know, to, frankly, just accepting the fact of death to so much stuff. I mean, they go through the gamut here, man, and it absolutely pays off. And I love... It's kind of weird to say I love the set design, but, like, the car itself, like, the car is slowly getting more colder, and it's turning into this ice box slowly but surely, and the fact of barely any food and barely any water and just trying to survive the elements and hopefully somebody coming to the rescue. It is an amazing story, guys. I mean, truly, this movie was a master class in pacing, in acting, and just in a very satisfying storytelling way. Because again, I don't know if many filmmakers could pull something like this off. You know, a two-person movie inside of a car for 90 minutes and it working. And this did, man. I mean, the only movie that kind of reminds me in some ways of this, I suppose, is the movie Frozen. And no, I'm not talking about the Disney Frozen movie. I'm talking about the horror movie Frozen, where these these skiers and snowboarders are on this lift, and at night, the lift 
stops and they're stuck on on the lift and it's just the cold weather and it's they're freezing and they're getting numb and they're up on this incredible height and they got to worry about you know the animals and you know trying to keep each other warm and it's just it's just this fight for survival i think this movie is better than frozen i just think it's a very very fascinating movie of just you know just a a chance of trying to trust your significant other and how this really challenges you and challenges your your love and and trust and dedication to the person that that you essentially you know have have said you know obviously your vows of you know you know you know through sickness and health you know a, li a life and death and all that jazz and this is a testament to that damn man I thought this was great, man. And I don't even know what I would do in this situation. I mean, you think, because you think to yourself, you know, oh, I, I know what I would do in that situation. But truly, when you're put in something like this, you don't know until you're there. And then you got to think on your feet. And it's a, it's it's great. I mean, like I said, this is a slow burn of a horror movie. And I don't know if I would exactly call it a horror movie. More as it's like a, a thrilling drama, I suppose. But it's got some really interesting elements to it. And I really love the survival aspect to this. I thought it was really well done. I truly did, man. I mean, no one is coming to save you. You got to save yourself. And when you're in those type of circumstances, you know, it's, you know, it's like fight. You know, just the instinct kicks in, man. And it's very fascinating what these people had to go through. The fact that this is a true story in some form is just wild to me that this that this happens. I live in a very cold weather state that there are certain times during the the winter that you are literally so numb from the cold that you can't feel your fingers you can't feel your face and you know you don't know if you were to stay outside for another five or ten minutes you could literally lose a hand lose a finger you could die so uh, i've been in these situations not as crazy as this but just the fight for survival is fascinating, man. So if you're into these type of movies, I guarantee you, this is definitely a good one. Speaking of survival, well, you know, you gotta survive a lot of backwoods weirdos when you're dealing with Wrong Turn. Yes. Oh, finally getting a chance to see Wrong Turn. We still haven't learned. Oh, no. <laughs> We haven't, have we? Oh, God. So, I got a chance to watch this on Amazon Prime, man. And I guess, wasn't it just a matter of time till we were going to get a Wrong Turn reboot? I mean, seriously, there's literally been so many horror reboots and remakes that you you kind of start to ask yourself, what hasn't been remade yet? And I was like, oh, yeah, wrong turn hasn't, huh? Well, you can count that that out now because it's officially rebooted now, baby. And I got to admit, I've always had a soft spot for the original wrong turn movie with Elijah Dushku. I, I don't know, man. I mean, it's not a great movie by any means, but there's something about it that I like. I like the the um, deformed cannibals. I like, you know, some of the teenagers. Elijah Dushku ain't too bad to look at either. So there was some things. I like some of the horror stuff aspect to it, the the kills. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff there. And I know of the other ones, but I haven't really dived into the other Wrong Turn movies. It's just, I know of them. I've maybe seen bits and pieces, but that's about all I've ever really done, guys. But I do know... And definitely appreciate that first wrong turn movie. I mean, basically, it's almost like, like, Hills Have Eyes, but updated in a lot of ways. 
So I was very curious about Wrong Wrong Turn, the the reboot, and how what they were going to keep, what they were going to leave out. Now, basically, it's about these group of 20-somethings who go to this sort of small backwoods area for vacation or something like that. And the locals are really not too kind to them. They kind of really don't want them to be there, frankly. And they say, hey, look, you know, if you're going in the woods, be careful. There's a trail. Stick to the trail. Don't veer off of it. And they don't really say much from that. And, well, you know, these 20-somethings don't necessarily listen. And some really, really nasty things go down. Survival is only the half of it. <laughs> oh, man. So, I got to admit, I was, as a horror movie lover, I was both, horrified at the fact of watching this but also kind of excited because i'm like okay it's not that you can't redo the original wrong turn i'm just kind of curious of what they would actually do with it and i gotta admit i like some of the stuff that they did here man now truth be told there is a lot of things that don't work in this movie i don't really like a lot of the 20 something characters they come off as smug some of them come off as arrogant some are basically incredibly naive. Some are frankly stupid. Others, others, you're just like, dude, you caused your own demise. You screwed yourself over. Now you're screwing everybody else over. And, and you kind of don't feel out of sympathy for some of these characters. And that's a problem. Because again, you want to feel for these characters. You want to like them. Uh, kind of kind of make them somewhat likable, right? I mean, it's just part of it. Now, that's not to say all the characters are that way, but most are. And I like the turn here, right? Because when you go to the town, you're thinking this is this is backwoods, hicks, hillbillies that are all kind of um, in on this. And they're all, you, you know, telling them to go in the woods. And, of course, they're going to get captured and, you know, with these deformed cannibals. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. There is no deformed cannibals in this movie. So if you're looking for this to be, be the same thing as the original wrong turn, you are dead wrong, dead mistaken. No way, no how. There are not uh, weird-looking cannibals in the woods. Now, I will spoil this for a second or so, so if you are not up for that, then definitely uh, go further in the video. But what it is, is actually this, this small backwoods society of people who branched away from, from society, from normal society, years and years, years, decades, decades ago. And they created their own society in the woods. And basically, the normal everyday society that you and I live in, they don't deal with them. You know, they don't bother us. We don't bother them. But if you go in the woods, you're putting your life in your own hands. And these people have their own laws. They have their own way of living. And if you violate that, then they they are well within they believe their own rights to to prosecute you and kill you that's what this is and i thought it was really interesting because you know there there's an interesting moral compass in this video in uh, in this movie guys there's a moral compass in this movie of the idea of this society and there's one of the 20 somethings that kills one of their people, right? And when they're being brought to whatever trial this is, you know, they go, well, these people were threatening our lives. And the one guy in this society is like, were they? Because we were going to actually bring you back to the wood area where you could be found. And you just thought that we were actually going to attack you. But what evidence do you have? That that's the case and you're like oh wow like they're actually kind of right like they flipped it on you like you weren't expecting them to flip it in that wait a minute you're the bad guys and we're innocent 
However, I'm not going to lie, guys, that quickly changes, like, big time, man, because, no, no, they're, they're evil, and their twisted logic is really messed up, man. I like the idea that it's not the cannibals. I do like that. I, you know, I know that a lot of people are probably going to get pissed by that. Ah, it's not the cannibals, and shit, that really sucks. I get it, and I understand it. But... You know, at the end of the day, do you want the same old thing or do you want something slightly different with a little bit of imagination? I kind of thought that with this movie. Now, I will say this, there is a lot of disappointment outside of that as well. As I said, the 20-somethings are not always the most likable. Sometimes the acting isn't always the greatest. And the kills, I wasn't very impressed by you know, it's kind of interesting because I've seen some quotes online where they're like, oh, this movie's brutal. And, and I'm like, brutal? Man, man, I've seen a Friday the 13th movie from the 80s be more brutal than this shit. Like, damn, man. Like, brutal? Shit, what movies have you been watching? Fuck, man. <laughs> like, I mean, this, this is not as brutal as it could have been. It could have been way more brutal. Man, I mean, I mean, you look at something like The Devil's Rejects back in 2005. That was brutal. Man, I mean, and this is 2020-2021 movie, and it's not nearly as brutal as something back from 2005. So that tells you that they didn't do their good job as they could. There, There is some moments of good blood and gore, but very few and far between, I will admit, man. I like the moral idea of the movie. I like its twisted sense of logic. I think it's very interesting. And I really like the ending. I was not prepared for where the ending was going to go. I thought I thought once, you know, they end up perhaps getting rescued, you think to yourself, "Oh, it's the end." And not even close, man. I mean, I thought it was kind of very fascinating and interesting. Would I like to see a sequel to this movie? I'm not against it, but I'm going to admit I don't really see a clear path to getting there. I really don't. I, I think you could do it, but I don't know if it would end up being the best horror sequel. I think it would kind of be a little lame. But that being said, look, this had all the potential to be one of the worst horror remakes in the past, like, 20 or 25 years. It had the potential to, to be. And I think it actually decided that it wasn't going to be that. And it's actually going to be something really smart and really clever. So, for me, I'm going to give it props, man. I mean, I don't think it's a perfect movie by any means. I think there are certain faults here. And I think the characters are definitely one of them. And there are moments with the society that y y you kind of scratch your head on certain things. Or even some of the stuff and in, in normal society where you're like, come on, guys. Are, you know, this, this is how you're going to treat these people. I mean, you should honestly have told them the truth. Because had you told them the truth, none of this would have ever happened in the first place. But no, you got to be secret and hide shit. And it's like, come on, man. Yeah, that, that secret hiding bullshit. Give me a fucking break, man. But it is pretty good, and I gotta give props. As far as the acting's concerned, the main female chick, I think, here, uh, Charlotte Vega, does a really, really great job. And so does Matthew Modine. Yes, 80s star Matthew Modine, Stranger Things Matthew Modine is in this. He plays the father to the main chick, and he does a great job. Like, seriously, anytime Matthew Modine was on screen, I'm like, dude, that's like, you know, like Gross Anatomy, Matthew Modine, dude. And he's he's fighting these these hillbillies. I'm like, I'm like oh, man, where did, we, where did we go with this, man? But I thought he did a good job, dude, seriously. So there had potential to be a lot of problems with this, guys. I'm not going to lie. But overall, I got to admit, this one... Definitely surprised me. Ah, it's not mutated cannibals, but, you know, you can't have it all. And last, but certainly not least, the Blu-ray of Lady Sings the Blues. 
<laughs> oh, I know. I'm I'm good, guys. No need to applaud. <laughs> Diana Ross is Billie Holiday in Latest Things the Blues. The first time on Blu-ray. I was actually surprised that Walmart had this, man. I'm serious. Like usually these these special releases, usually Walmart doesn't carry. Or sometimes they, they don't. But I was like, this movie? Okay. And I haven't seen this movie in a really, really long time, man. It's been a, quite a while, man. But Diana Ross plays Billie Holiday, and it's about, obviously, the life, the times, the struggles of the singer. And it's a really, really great movie, man. And it's kind of interesting, Diana Ross, because Diana Ross hasn't really done a lot of acting. You know, I was looking at some of her filmography, and, like, you know, the first thing she ever did was, like, a a role on one of the episodes of Tarzan back in the late 60s, man. I mean, I mean, really? I, most people would know her from The Wiz, but honestly, this movie is phenomenal. She does such a really, really wonderful job in in this role, man. I mean, obviously... She conveys so many emotions of this singer at so many di different times in, in her life. And the other cast here is amazing. Richard Pryor, Billy D. Williams, man. I mean, it's so interesting because I think this is one of these movies that really has, over time, gotten forgotten. I think it really has, man. I mean, you know, sometimes with certain movies we say that. Like, oh, this movie got forgotten. But truly, this movie got forgotten. I mean, nobody, if you're talking about Richard Pryor, this movie, I guarantee you, doesn't come up, not even close. Billy D. Williams, movie doesn't come up, not even close. Nobody would even talk about Diana Ross, and they'd talk about, of course, The Wiz. So, this movie has gotten forgotten, but as far as, like, a biopic is concerned, especially for a musician, this is a wonderful movie extremely well made the performances are fantastic here and this is a gem of a film if you're into these type of biopics definitely give this one a look man i'm surprised to have found this at walmart man and for a really decent price at that i mean it's the first time on blu-ray and you know we talk about a lot of really great biopics out there you know there's really great ones you know, obviously for for Queen and for a lot of these other bands, obviously the Beatles has a shit ton of them, and Elvis does, of course, and you name it. So many artists have gotten really great biopics, but go back and look at the ones that are forgotten, the ones that people don't really talk about, because you'll be surprised how good they really are. And Lady Sings the Blues really is fascinating, man. It truly is. And some good special features, too. You got commentary, deleted scenes, behind the blues. A lot of really great stuff here, man. I was surprised to see this, man. I knew this was coming out this week, but I was like, okay, we're probably not going to see this at any of the stores because, you know, this is not one of those movies that I, I think is is going to sell, like, you know, boatloads of titles of it. I wish. It's a great movie, but, you know, this is, I mean, I hate to say it, this, this ain't the fucking Avengers, okay? I mean, it's not the, the Avengers, it's it's not something that people are going to go out, out of their way to want to get, but I guarantee you, if you like biopics, and musical biopics at that, this is a fascinating story, and the acting is absolutely superb. Guys, definitely give this one a chance, man, seriously, and first time I'm on Blu-ray, not bad, and and releases like this, I will admit, over a short period of time, will eventually go out of print. So if you like the, the movie or interested in it, you might want to bite the bullet sooner rather than later, because before you know it, it could be gone. It happens more than you might think, guys, honestly. But not half bad this week. Some very interesting titles... For the second Walmart to have. Not have bad, I, I say, guys. Walmart goodness. Oh, how I love it. A little Billy Holiday love. Ah, backwoods societies. Never trust them. 
freezing in your own car and drug trafficking on social media. Oh, can't get any better than that. <laughs> Damn right, guys. Some really unique and interesting titles this time around. Again, not crazy plentiful amounts of titles worth showing off, but some cool gems worth giving a look to, guys, and that's all that I can really ask for with physical media. I mean, seriously, man. You know, for me, it doesn't matter whether it's a big abundance of titles or a smaller release week where I know we're not going to see a lot of stuff. I still put in the same amount of enthusiasm. I still try to do the best to show off as much physical media and really talk about this stuff to you guys because I really feel that, you know, it's worth diving into every single title. It's worth talking about it and... I think, you know, for me, the passion never goes away. It doesn't matter whether I was collecting physical media five, ten years ago, and it was even more plentiful back then, and I was just really loving, you know, just talking about movies, or now when it might not be as plentiful as it once was. But it's still worth it to this day, because I care that much about physical media, and I know you guys do too. Physical media is just important in so many aspects, in so many ways. And when you're a movie lover, and when you're a physical media lover, it never goes away. Truly, that love always stays with you, and it has definitely stayed with me, guys. So I hope you understand. I know you guys understand. It's... Good, bad, ugly, doesn't matter what release week we're in, physical media is always, always worth it, guys. And I know you truly believe that. I know, know you do, guys. And physical media love doesn't end here because we got one more location to go to and hopefully even more plentiful. Guess we're about to find out. Let's head to the next location and see what physical media we can find. All right, everybody, we are at our fourth and final location, and you know how we do it. We end it in spectacular fashion, usually with only the best. Yes, we are at our last location. That is none other than The Beast. Best Buy, baby. Yes, I am definitely looking forward to checking out Best Buy this week. It's been a slow but steady week for physical media. Some interesting exclusives, some interesting media that we've seen some of the other places. I wonder what Best Buy is going to have this week. Could have a lot or could have very little, depending. This is a very unpredictable week. Never know what we'll find, but Beast usually supplies all the goodies, so hopefully this week is no exception. Let's head in and check it out. All right, we are in at Best Buy under the new releases, and the only thing I'm seeing over here, guys, is I'm seeing, of course, The Crudes, A New Age, the DVD for $17.99, the Blu-ray DVD digital for $22.99, and they don't have it here, but the 4K was $27.99, but honestly, no exclusive for Cruise the New Age over here, which I'm actually kind of shocked because usually if Walmart's got an exclusive, if Target does, you'd almost be damn sure that you'd be getting one for Cruise the New Age, but unfortunately not at all, which is real weird to me, but two out of three I suppose ain't bad, but I was almost expecting we'd see a third one. Hmm, shocker on that one, not gonna lie, man. Now, I am kind of curious about your guys' thoughts on animated sequels. Good, bad, do they deliver on the expectations or do they fall extremely short? It's kind of interesting because for me, there's a lot of animated sequels that I really love. Of course, Toy Story 2 has to be in there. Frozen 2, yes, I do think Frozen 2 is a very damn good s sequel. I would also say Shrek 2 is really great as well. Um, the Incredibles 2, there, there's a lot of them that are really, really well done, man. And then there's ones that are kind of not so great to me. Uh, Mulan 2, not terrible, but 
kind of unneeded. I would say that Lion King 2 or Lion King 1 and a half, whatever it is, kind of to me felt a little unneeded as well. I would also probably say the return of Jafar. Nothing in the return of Jafar is terrible exactly, because I kind of actually like Return of Jafar, but the first Aladdin movie is so good that Return of Jafar kind of seems, again, unneeded, and it kind of feels like sometimes when the first movie is so good, the second one kind of feels like it didn't really need to be made, but there's a lot of times where it's kind of, uh, kind of different. Sometimes the sequel actually overperforms because the first one wasn't as good. But then there's other times where the first movie wasn't exactly like blowing the roof off the doors anyways. So the sequel kind of seems like just kind of... Kind of maintaining status quo, dare I say. Somewhere around there. Where does the cruise of New Age fit in? I think it fits in somewhere within a sequel that felt like it's a nice little add-on i enjoyed it i don't think it's memorable i don't think that it was necessarily needed and i don't think that necessarily people were going out of their way to actually like wow like we needed a cruise too like i don't know if there was as much like demand for it unless i was wrong i mean I, there was demand for a frozen 2 incredibles 2 there was a demand for another shrek movie i didn't really hear the big demand for the cruise a new age but that being said, I think some of those sequels up the game and the ante of storytelling and for characters. The Cruise New Age is a good one for kids to get back into the characters, but I don't think it changes the game in animation whatsoever. However, the animation is gorgeous and beautiful and it'll look amazing on a 4K TV, that's for damn sure. But I don't know if, if it blew the roof off of the doors, essentially. Will we get a third cruise movie i actually think we might get a third cruise movie because the second one actually did quite well at the box office i think you're going to see a lot of people buy it on physical media and on digital so i think there is going to be a demand for a third one which is kind of weird to me this is kind of one of those animated franchises that it's kind of just maintains it's not like the best it's not the worst it kind of is in the middle I don't know whether you guys agree with me, but there's some that are really great and some that are really kind of uh, a little bit, uh, a little on the outs, a little tired. The cruise doesn't feel tired. It just feels like, oh, hey, there's another cruise movie. I didn't really know that thing existed. That type of thing. Hmm. What do you guys think, think of animated sequels? And where do you rank the cruise in New Age? I don't rank it exactly high, but I don't rank it exactly low either. Hmm, definitely let me know what you guys think about that one. You do get two all-new exclusive shorts. Family movie night. Little Red... Okay. And in a world for pranks. Okay, deleted scenes. Stone Age... Okay, some decent fee features. Not really, not really like kids are really going to be into the special features or anything, but if you're into animation and you like crudes... Some good special fee features here. Like I said, I enjoyed the movie, and I think it's a great movie for kids. But as far as, like, animated movies that will be remembered, ones that really are special, I don't think The Crude's A New Age is exactly knocking on that door anytime soon. But I'm curious as to what you guys think. Definitely let me, me know, man. Definitely Crude's, but shocked about not having any, like, Steelbook edition. Because I could have sworn you get two... You'd eventually get the third, but mm, out with Cruz, though. Kind of, kind of weird on that one, but hey, at least they got, got something, at least to start off. So, let's see what else Best Buy has in store for us. And over on the back side, guys, we are seeing a few releases worth checking out. The first is wrong turn the blu-ray digital for 16.99 aha yes wrong turn still backwood folk but not you know dumb stupid redneck deformed cannibal folk ah the good old days 
<laughs> the good old days. The good old days when when deformed cannibals were deformed cannibals, huh? Oh man. Uh, look, I. <sighs> you guys know at this point my thoughts on horror remakes and reboots, but if you don't, I'm gonna be honest with you kind of don't like them okay it's not that i really hate every horror remake and reboot out there i i don't to be fair with with you guys i really don't i mean i guess if i had to say the worst one that i've ever seen it is a nightmare on elm street that thing is garbage that is a hot steamy pile of poo okay that's, that's real shit okay that is that is goddamn insulting of a, a, a movie, and I think my best probably has to be John Carpenter's The Thing. Might be one of the best ones I, I've I've ever seen. I truly do love that. And there's obviously other ones. Uh, probably another one I really hate would probably be Rob Zombie's Halloween. Yeah, that's, that one's real garbage too. There's been a lot of really really bad ones. To be fair, there's really more bad than there is good. With Wrong Turn, I think Wrong Turn is not offensive. I don't think people are going to watch this movie and literally hate the film, because I, I don't hate the movie, not by a long shot. There are some good things in here. But does it feel like Wrong Turn to me? I See, truth be told, I was never a real big fan of the Wrong Turn franchise. I'm going to be real with you guys. I mean, yes, the first movie I really love, but outside of that, it felt like they were just continuing to tell the same story just a little bit more cheaper every single time. You know what I'm saying? And that's kind of what it felt like, man. Oh, you know, deformed redneck cannibals are out to, to kill people. Oh, well, we'll put it in the snow this time. Or, oh, we'll, we'll put it in this little location. And we'll do this, we'll do that. It, just, it was a little bit of variation from Wrong Turn. And... Yeah, some of it worked better than others. I think they did, what, like six of them? I think they did like six Wrong Turn movies, man. They did a lot, a lot, a lot more than I thought they actually did. And now we finally got into the reboot territory. So where would I rank it if I had to rank it among the remakes and the reboots in modern horror history? Well, it certainly ain't the worst. Okay, it's not like The Stepfather or some of those really terrible Texas Chainsaw Massacre movies. It's not like it's not like a lot of that really terrible crap that you've seen but before. But then again, it's not as good as The Grudge or The Ring or or even that that Texas Chainsaw Massacre reboot with Jessica Biel, which I thought was really really solid of a movie. I thought that was really good. I would say this is a little bit in between. I thought it was a good movie. I'm not quite sure I would have called it Wrong Turn, though. I feel like, at this point, people know what the franchise is. Wrong Turn is deformed, you know, man-eating cannibals. That's what they are. If you're, if you're not doing the same thing, why call it Wrong Turn? But at the same time, I appreciated the fact that they didn't do the same thing, though. So there's a little bit of back and forth there. I'm very curious as to what people are going to think about this. I think there's going to be one crowd of the horror realm that are really going to like this movie. That they did something slightly different and it wasn't the same song and dance that you'd seen before. At the same time, I think some people are going to be like, Well, it wasn't Deformed Cannibals. I'm so pissed because I wanted my Deformed Cannibal love. And... <laughs> And I'm like, I'm sorry, there's like six movies in the Wrong Turn franchise that you can watch already. There's the Hills, Hills Have Eyes and a whole lot of other ones, so just watch those? Eh? <laughs> I don't know, man. Uh, at the end of the day, I enjoyed the movie. I didn't love it. I had a lot of issues. Characters, some of the plot stuff felt a little weak. But I like some of the twists and turns that I didn't see coming. And I thought it was going to be very predictable. And at the end of the day, there were things in there that wasn't as predictable as I thought they were going to be. So honestly, honestly, I was a fan of it for the most part. But if you're going in thinking that this is the same old wrong turn that you've seen before, this is not your mama's wrong turn. This, 
this is not your daddy's wrong turn. This is not your deformed uncle's wrong turn. This is a whole new thing. And you're either going to be on board with it or you're going to be against it. But I guarantee you guys, I think that you're going to appreciate some of the twists and turns that they do end up making. And I think you're going to appreciate the fact that it's not like a psycho where it's like a word for word, shot for shot remake that literally feels completely useless. It feels a little bit more genuine than that. And I think at the end of the day, you guys hopefully we'll at least appreciate that aspect to it i hope that makes sense man you do get here deleted and extended scenes monsters among us making wrong turn promotional trailer and audio commentary very nice man you know look i'm gonna be honest with you i i was around where we had that huge stretch of terrible remakes and reboots. I mean, you know, the, you know, the Chuckies of the world and the Halloweens of the world and Nightmare on Elm Street and y you name it. They were literally remaking every fucking thing in the book, man. And I knew eventually Wrong Turn had had to be on the chopping block. It just had to, man. But honestly, I was prepared for the worst and it ended up being halfway decent. So truth be told, Mm, could it came out far worse so I at least have to be thankful for that right and then I'm seeing they have the DVD of the From Dust Till Dawn trilogy for $12.99 really they actually have this here at Best Buy wow oh my god this one's a blast from the past guys holy shit damn the From Dust Till Dawn series Shit, the DVD love, man, oh my god, boy, that's crazy, man, god, from dusk till dawn, that is a blast from the past, wow, that's nuts, man, holy shit, god, dude, I love the first from dusk till dawn movie, man, George Clooney, Quentin Tarantino, Harvey Keitel, Juliette Lewis, like, there's something about that, man, that I just really love. I don't know why, man. That, that, that movie still to this day, man, directed by Robert motherfucking Rodriguez. It was, like, the best time, dude, because, like, George Clooney was becoming a big star. He was on ER. Quentin Tarantino was obviously this big hotshot from Pulp Fiction and Reservoir Dogs and had written some stuff. Him and Rob Robert Rodriguez coming together. Julia Lewis, of course, this is 96, so she's riding off the high of a lot of earlier films that she's done, especially Natural Born Killers. Harvey Keitel was big in, in the 90s. It was like everything coming together, dude. And it was like Robert Rodriguez from the El Mariachi movies, and it was like, okay, it's like, okay, man, let's, let, let's strap in for this motherfucker. <laughs> and... It was so damn good. And what I love about it is that, like, it's this, it's this criminal road movie for, like, the first half of the movie. And then the second half turns into this wild vampire movie. Like, like just at the titty twister and these, these, these fucking strippers are, like, 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 chewing on people's necks. And, like, and, like, all these people are turning into, like, vampires and they're trying to hide and kill all these motherfuckers. I'm like, whoa. It was the coolest fucking movie i had seen like at that time man i remember like the first time i ever watched it was on cinemax and that was like one of the first times i had ever seen selma hayek and i'm like uh what i'm like mom didn't tell me about this when she was talking about the birds and the bees <laughs> like like, like that, that's for damn sure i'm like i'm like uh, uh what's 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 happening <laughs> like, holy shit man it's just honestly a great mix of action and horror and honestly it was really for me as a movie lover one of the first times i ever really got to see Tarantino experienced Robert Rodriguez and 
and I just look back at that time period, like '96. I'm like, God, this is this is pre Batman and Robin for George Clooney, and there's just something really great about that time period of like the Tarantino time, the Robert Rodriguez time. Like it was just great indie horror filmmaking. They both were fans of the horror genre. They loved vampires. It was a great mix of special effects. Like there were so much things, man, that just was a real pleasure to watch in that movie. Still to this day, man, it's still a great movie to this day, man. All things considered, whether the effects have aged well or not, whatever, it doesn't matter, man. It's still a great movie. Then you have the next two movies. Oh, man. Texas Blood Money and The Hangman's Daughter. Oh, oh, Lord, dude. You know, I've seen those movies, and they are such pale comparisons to, like, the original from Dust Till Dawn, man. I mean, they really honestly are. I mean, truly, they are so... I mean, they're not terrible. Well, I mean, Texas Blood Money's not outright terrible. I mean, it, it, it does not hold a candle to From Dust Till Dawn. And look, I mean, you do have the great Robert Patrick in the second film. I mean, come on. I mean, Texas Blood Money, it is pretty cool, dude. Robert Patrick is badass. But again, is he George Clooney badass? Ah, dude, I don't know, man. I mean, George Clooney was really badass in From Dust Till Dawn. I don't know if he really, like, it's comparison. I mean, yes, Robert Patrick is more badass than George Clooney anyways. I mean, I'll give you guys that 110%. But... For, from Dust Till Dawn, I don't know. I, I just didn't think the story was as good or the characters. I didn't think it was as memorable. It was really just another straight straight to DVD, you know, horror action flick pretty much. And the third one, Hangman's Daughter, uh, that's pretty much a prequel. goes back to like 100 years or so before any of the events of the other From Dust Till Dawn movies happen, and so it's sort of the origins of Santanical Pandemonium and the Titty Twister and all that jazz. Did you really need it? No. But what the fuck? We're going to exploit the From Dust Till Dawn franchise, so why not another straight-to-DVD movie? Hey, they were popular. Why the fuck not, man? Oh, yeah, of course, dude. You know, look... All things considered, the the only movie you really need to watch is the first from Dust Till Dawn, dude. That's what you need to watch, man. Uh, but if you want to dive into the other from Till from Dust Till Dawn movies, I'm not saying they're terrible, but you know, go in knowing that you, you you know you're not exactly watching Shakespeare and shit. I mean, okay, and you're definitely it's, it's such a pale comparison to the first from Dust Till Dawn, dude. I will say this much though, right? The one thing I love about this trilogy is I believe all three films have Danny Trejo in them. I believe they do, man. Like, like the first one definitely does, and then the second and third one. And what's crazy about it, right, guys, is that he fucking died in the first movie. He died. He got his ass staked. He's dead. He comes back in the fucking sequel. Like, wait, wait, wait a minute, bro. Didn't you die? Wait a minute, I'm pretty sure you died. Oh, well, I, I, I have a twin brother. <laughs> <laughs> some shit. Like what? What? It's like, just a random shit, man. And and then you know, being of course the hangman's daughter and everything. Oh man. Oh god, dude. You know, from Dust Till Dawn is such great memories and opened the door to so many really interesting actors and directors and and genre that I still love to this very day, man. It just. It was a blast to watch, man. And I remember, again, at Cinemax, watching it when I was not allowed to. And watching it late at night with my parents sleeping. And it was just, it was just a time when you would watch some really weird horror flicks at night on Cinemax. Along with, of course, the Skinemax. <laughs> you'd watch it, and then you'd go into, like, you know, school the next day. You'd be like, dude, do you know what I watched? I watched, like, From Dust Till Dawn, and you would, you would talk about it. And then you'd be like, well, you know, I also watched this, uh, this like, porn flick, too. But, <laughs> you know, dude, we had the best fun, dude. And it was a great time for vampire movies as well. You know, From Dust Till Dawn, and you had John Carpenter's Vampires, and you had such really great, cool little action horror flicks that were really great. And I have to admit something, guys. The sequels, as cheesy as they are, 
there's there's something about them that I just love the cheesiness of it. It's the same way with like Vampire, right? They did like this vampire movie with Bon Jovi called Vampires Los Mirtos. And it's like so terrible. And it's it's like such a pale comparison to John Carpenter's Vampires, but they made that movie. And it's the same way with the From Dust Till Dawn franchise. It's like they made this? What? Like come on, man. Like, but it, everybody was may making sh- shitty sequels back then. So you know, you know, hindsight being twenty twenty, you wouldn't do it. But what the fuck, man? Oh God, dude, such such crazy wild times, dude. I I, I loved it, man. And the, you know, the, the movies, cheesy as they are, are fucking awesome, dude. And I gotta admit, this also has Full Tilt Boogie. And if you guys have never watched Full Tilt Boogie, it is a full-length documentary on the making of From Dust Till Dawn, and it is amazing. I have the old-school DVD of From Dust Till Dawn, and it comes with Full Tilt Boogie, and, and honestly, do a double feature of From Dust Till Dawn and Full Tilt Boogie, because it is so great, man. The hijinks that they got into with that movie, they were sleeping with, like, various crew members and actors, and the, the craziness that they got to on, on set, and the crazy, like, like you know inventiveness and the creativeness of it all like it was it was a wild documentary about the making of a movie and it's probably one of the best i've ever seen like that's cool that this comes with it i can't say that this is like i mean 12.99 is worth it just for the first movie and full tail boogie the second movie i mean okay you get robert patrick cheesiness and you get you get a really terrible from dust till dawn prequel okay cool whatever for 12.99 what 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 the hell man but ah dude i will always remember from T- dust till dawn i'll always love it and to be honest with you guys they do have the tv series out there and i watched the first season of the from dust till dawn tv series which i actually quite enjoy well, I've actually only watched the first season of it, and I actually really like the first season. They they stuck very close to the actual like movie, with some alterations. But I know going forward, it was really gonna change. I never watched anything past the first season, but I really liked the first season though. I really did enjoy that. I might have to get more into it because, God, man, talk about a From Dust Till Dawn movie that definitely needs like a great collector's edition Blu-ray or 4K release. Man, damn. God, this is such... I could talk about this movie all day, guys. Seriously, I love this movie, man. From, like, half-naked Selma Hayek, Quentin Tarantino sucking Selma Hayek's toes. Like, what? <laughs> and, like, everything in between, dude. Oh, my God. This movie's, this movie's wild, man, but so fun, dude. God, I can't believe they have this here. For twelve ninety nine, uh, for a three-set... DVD and the feature length making of ah that ain't half bad dude that ain't half bad and also dude just saying it is worth it just for the Cheech Marin monologue that he has when they go into the titty twister they're like you know dog pussy apple pie pussy you know that pussy you know you know you know you know you'll fuck it <laughs> you know it's like if we don't got it, you know, you know, you don't fuck it, you know, like so, like oh my god, Jesus Christ, it's so good, dude. Oh my god, from dusk till dawn, man, what a blast from the past. Then I'm seeing they have the Blu-ray digital of Silk Road for sixteen ninety nine, and I gotta talk about Nick Robinson for a second, man. He's really fantastic in the movie. He's awesome. Does a really phenomenal job here. And he's an actor that's actually starting to grow on me a little bit more every time I see him in, in roles. Because I remember when I first saw him in, I believe it was Jurassic World. And I'm not really a fan of that movie exactly, but I wasn't really even a fan of his character. It kind of came off a little bit annoying and kind of a jerk. But he, he did a good job overall, I'd say, man. I mean, he, he kind of did, man. But it wasn't until I really saw him in Love, Simon... And what a great movie that is, man. It's really dramatic and very heartfelt. And he does a really solid performance, man. Amazing. And I was like, okay, this is a guy that I've really got to look out out for, man. And I know he's doing some really interesting stuff. He's in that miniseries about, like, the student having sex with his teacher. I don't really know much about it. I haven't seen it yet. 
Not, not that we haven't seen that movie a time or two, but that's interesting. And I know he did a movie recently with Chloe Grace Moretz, which I have to catch as well. But he did a phenomenal job with this movie, man. And he's definitely a young actor that I'm definitely looking forward to seeing what he does next. It's kind of interesting because there's a lot of really great young talent out there. You know, the Tom Hollins of the world, Timothee Chalamet, Nicholas Holt, uh, Finn Wolfhard. A lot of people coming up in a big, bad way, man. And it's kind of tough to really separate yourself from the pack. Right, it's got to do with the the movies you choose and whether they're box office hits. And there's all kinds of movie politics that go into it, guys. And some are going to have really long and promising careers. And other people are going to go the way of the dinosaur. And you never hear of them again after a few films. I hope Nick Robinson is not that guy. Because I think he has a lot of promise. But I guess we'll see where the future holds for him. But if movies like Silk Road are any sort of indication, he's really great at his craft. And I think he has a long career ahead of him. I truly do think, think so, guys. I, at least that's just my honest opinion. You do get Source Code, The Panther, Silk Road, and an audio commentary as well. Not bad, man. Not so bad. This was a wild story. And I did not know that this was, this was as true as it was, man. What a, what a crazy, just true story, man. The wild world of the internet. Man, the early days of of the internet, man. It was like the wild, wild west. And some motherfuckers took advantage of it in a big, bad way, dude. What a fascinating story, man. Wild adventure. Strange, but true. And the last thing I'm seeing over here, guys, is the Blu-ray of Centigrade for $16.99. There's not much more to say about this movie. I did compare it earlier to Frozen, and that's a pretty good, accurate, for the most part, assessment. But there's actually some really great overall uh, survival movies, like in Harsh Elements, that are really, really great, man. Kind of similar to Sound of Great. Maybe not as good, but still worth worthy. Like, I was thinking, like, Open Water which is great. I think The Shallows is another one. Uh, of course, The Gray is really, really good, too. I would also say Sanctum from 2011 is not bad. And there's also another one that maybe you guys don't know about, and that is 247 Degree Fahrenheit. It's a movie that not many people really know about. I believe it's from 2011, if I'm not mistaken, with Scout Taylor Compton. And... It's basically about these group of friends that get trapped in in this sauna and they can't get out and it's just like what what does it do to you mentally and physically and you're just trapped in there and the horror of it and the claustrophobia like it, it's actually pretty decent not many people really talk about that one but it's not half bad man and there's a lot of ones like that good little survival tales from being in really harsh elements and i gotta say this is one of the best ones i mean seriously i i was shocked how good this was i wasn't expecting it to be as good as it was and it really just shocked me in a big bad way and i was blown away man the acting was phenomenal and i thought slowly the car turning more frozen and the harsher elements, like, all of it worked, man. Seven Degree was a real surprise for, for me, me, man. Truly was, man. I think if you're willing to give it a chance, it takes its time to get going. And I think the slowness of it might be something that people are not going to be into. But I guarantee you that if you stick with it, it's, it's a really great dramatic journey, man. Definitely worth exploring, dude. Seriously, pretty, pretty damn so solid, dare I say, dude. Pretty damn solid indeed. No special features, but I wish we we would have, man. A commentary or a making of or something talking about, you know, the inspiration that they took from the true story and the elements that they kept and the ones that they, like, put, put in for creative license. I would have loved to have seen that stuff, man. Nah, well, doesn't really, really matter. If you love the movie, then it's worth owning. Centigrade is amazing, man. So definitely do. Awesome. Absolutely, absolutely awesome, dude. As is most of these releases, not half bad, guys. Pretty good this week. 
I'm pretty happy for Best Buy overall. Thought they did, did a decent job this week, and by God, who would have ever thought? <laughs> Seriously. Oh, man. All right. Let's head out. Best Buy was not half bad this time around. Not half bad. Oh, pretty decent, actually. I mean, for a slower release week, not as many titles out there in stores. I thought the variety was pretty good. The selection. A lot of different type of genres for all you movie lovers out there. And freaking From Dusk Till Dawn trilogy D DVD at Best Buy of all places. Yeah, that was pretty wild. I wasn't expecting that one, <laughs> Yeah, not half bad. Not not really exclusive love this week as I thought we would get. But hey, the variety was pretty good, so I got to give Best Buy a little bit of love, man. Not half bad this week. Some pretty good stuff worth checking out, dare I say. All right. I was loving the beast as usual. Most of the time it delivers, and this week did its de job pretty decently, dare I say. All right. Let's head home and finish the video. All right, everybody. That'll do it for the Blu-ray and DVD out and about video this week. And it turned out to be slightly better than what I was anticipating it was going to be, guys. I mean, truth be told, I knew it was going to be an okay week. We had some releases were showing off, but it wasn't going to be big and bombastic. But I know that... Not every week is going to be like that, guys. There's going to be a little bit smaller weeks, less impressive weeks, bigger, tons of stuff to show off weeks, but physical media is worth showing off regardless. does not matter, you know, what week we're, we're in. Every week, there's always something worth showing off, and I try to do the best I can every single week, and sometimes that's easier said than done, but... Still trying to find as many releases, and this week had some interesting surprises, some exclusives, and some decent overall media we're checking out. So you know what? Hey, I will take it, guys. I hope you will, too. Hope you picked up something good or at least worth checking out. Definitely let me know, guys. As far as I'm concerned, well, I actually did get a package in the mail from... Amazon.com, and I'm actually going to show you guys this one. Actually, I've already opened it up, not going to lie, man. And, oh, this one I had to get. And that is... Bam! Pump up the volume, baby, from Warner Archive Collection. Dude, I had to pick it up. Are you, are you kidding me? <laughs> I had to pick this thing up. Oh, my God, man. Do you realize that I used to watch this on VHS? Back in the day, I used to watch this, man. My mother and father, this was one of the ones where they literally taped it on VHS. And I, I loved it. You know, it was so, it was so cool of a movie. And Christian Slater was like the coolest motherfucker on the planet at that point, man. I mean, he was the rebellious, you know, cool as hell, charming, bad boy persona that he really portrayed on screen. This movie and movies like Heathers really just reinforced how fucking awesome Christian Slater is, man. And this is great. And I love how he has those different personas. Like in the daytime, he's very much, you know very shy, closeted guy, and then at night his his just personality opens up being this rebellious DJ, and I, damn, I've always loved this movie, dude, I always have, it's just a really great slice of late 80s, early 90s, and, and honestly, dude, Christian Slater was at like the peak, man, it's so great, and I'm so happy that Warner Archive Collection actually released this thing, man. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't actually come with any special features, really, unfortunately, but I gotta admit, man, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You wanna know why? Because I am damn glad to have this in the collection, man. I haven't seen this movie in, whoo, man, it has to be like, 
uh, I would dare say like 15 years? Something like that, man. It's been a long ass time since I've seen this movie, man. That's about to get rectified in a big bad way, man. Oh my god, Pomo's volume. So damn good, dude. <laughs> oh, wow, man. Oh, God, I, I, I love this movie so much. This is, this, this, is, this is a keeper. That's for damn sure, man. Not that one. But that is not all, guys, because I also got a package in the mail from Diabolic Day by Day. Yes, indeed, I did. Now, these are the last two pickups for the... February goodness guys now the first here is actually another documentary yes I seem to be getting a little bit of documentary love this month and this one is no exception it's actually a Shudder original and it, it seems to be a really great fascinating documentary uh, about horror and and a certain group of people's sort of place within the horror genre. I, I'm fascinated to check this one out. I always love these type of documentaries, so this one is right up my alley. I've heard really great things about it. And last but certainly not least is actually a horror TV movie directed by Frank Darabont that Kino Lorber gave a little bit of love to, and I'm so happy to finally have this as well. So, man, I am looking forward to these two releases, but you will only get to find out exactly what I picked up until my Blu-ray pickups video, which will drop sometime soon. <laughs> It'll show off all of the titles that I got for the month, and it's going to be a quite a good haul, man. Uh, out of print, love, collector's editions, limited edition releases, documentaries, and a lot of really cool stuff. So definitely stay tuned for that. And stay tuned this weekend, guys, because, well, things had to change a little bit. Because we were actually going to put out our Little Things movie review last weekend. However, there was a Dollar Tree video that took a little bit of precedent. And I was like, okay, that one's coming out. Let's put that, 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 that out there for you guys. So I did put out the Dollar Tree out and about video it is on the channel if you haven't checked it out it's two hours of physical media goodness definitely check that out so this weekend will hopefully god willing be the little things movie review also the november 2020 pickup video finally gonna be putting that one out and i'm planning a couple of special stuff coming up soon as as well trying to get back into the grind of youtube and um, I think you guys will be pretty happy with what's coming up within the next month or so. Some really great reviews, pickup videos, and a lot of physical media love. And before I let you guys go, I gotta talk about this. Because this is a pretty cool article and I love diving into, into this stuff, man. So I found this article through Facebook... Who is still buying VHS tapes? I love this. Despite the rise of streaming, there is still a vast library of moving images that are categorically unavailable anywhere else. Also a big nostalgia factor. Let's, let's get into this. This is great, guys. The last VCR, according to Dave Rodriguez, 33, a digital repository librarian at Florida State University in Tallahassee, Florida, was produced in 2016. But the VHS tape itself may be immortal. Today, a robust marketplace exists both virtually and in real life for this. On Instagram, sellers tout videos for sale like the 2003 Jerry Bruckheimer film Kangaroo Jack. And the asking price is $190. Okay, now if 190 feels outrageous, think about this. There is literally a copy, a limited edition copy of the 1989 Disney film The Little Mermaid, which is listed on Etsy for $45,000. I'm not even kidding you guys, $45,000. The cover art for this hard-to-find copy is said to contain a male anatomic, 
politically correct part drawn into a sea castle. I didn't even know this existed, okay? There is, it turns out, much demand for these old VHS tapes, price tags notwithstanding, and despite post-2006 advancements in technology, driving the passionate collection of this form of media is the belief that VHS offers something that other types of media simply cannot. The general perception that people can essentially order whatever movie they want from home is flat out wrong. This is from Matthew Booth, 47, the owner of Videodrome in Atlanta, which sells VHS tapes in addition to its Blu-ray and DVD rental business. Streaming, Mr. Booth said, was promised as a giant video store on the internet, where a customer was only at one click away from the exact film they were looking for. But the reality, he said, is that new releases are prohibitively expensive. Content is fractured between subscription services and movies operate in cycles, often disappearing before people have the chance to watch them. In that sense, the VHS tape offers something the current market cannot. A vast library of moving images that are unavailable anywhere else. Anything that you can think of is on VHS tape because you've got to think it was a revolutionary piece of the media. It was a way for everyone to capture something and then put it out there. There is, Mr. Trader said, just so much culture packed into VHS. And it includes other people's home videos and, and you name it. It's just such a big nostalgia for this type of, of form of media. And they go on to say, because there's a very interesting parts of this article, guys. There's this woman who literally owns between, you know, 2,400 to 2,500 VHS tapes. And, you know, she goes on to say, I think we were the last to grow up without the internet, without cell phones or social media. And she feels very natural with VHS tapes rather than some of the digital stuff that she's seen before. And it's also very interesting because, you know, they say something else here, which I really liked. And what they also said was that, let me see here. Ah, he says, Mr. Arrow also noted the importance of the video store. Itself a somewhat obsolete idea, the Blockbuster video rental chain, which once owned more than 9,000 stores worldwide, now has one remaining brand, or branch I should say, in Bend, Oregon. It was like going to a supermarket. You were browsing. You might look on the wall for new releases, or you might look on the wall for the video store employee's pick of the week. The tactile sensation of selecting a movie he said no longer exists in the current landscape of Netflix, Amazon, and other on-demand rental providers. And they go on to say how VHS was just really revolutionary and how it changed the game in a lot of ways and how there's something about VHS that they say is very timely, especially in the age of digital. Now, I'm going to be real with you guys. I don't collect VHS. I haven't collected VHS in a very, very, very long time. It's been a, it's been a long damn while, man. But I can't say that, but I, I, I can't say that it's lost on me that this is still a popular form and people really still love VHS. There's something about it that to me, I can see the nostalgia factor and why people crave it still to this day. I mean, there are literally new horror movies that go out of their way to make copies of the VHS so that people can go out of their way to own them. Hell, my mother still has her VHS tapes and she still has a VHS player. It's crazy, but it really is true. And... I think there was something revolutionary about that at the time, whether it was the home movies that people were making or the fact that literally anything and everything got on a VHS tape. And the most obscure movies to the big Hollywood blockbusters and there was something about the access to that that really felt like nothing you had ever seen before. And the possibilities were literally endless. 
And there was something so fascinating and wondrous about that. And, you know, those times, sadly, are, are gone. You know, and it really is true that I'm one of the last generations that actually grew up without the internet, without the social media presence. And I would go into these video rental stores looking for VHS tapes of movies that I was interested in. And, you know, oh, what's what's the new stuff coming out? What, what's the old school horror stuff that that I can sneak past my mom? <laughs> like, there, there was always something, man. And the nostalgia of it is really cool. And it's interesting that they put it into a form that's very, in, very, very interesting to talk about. The idea that, you know, I'm not saying that it won't happen at some point, but he is right in the article that we were promised that the digital platform for movies was literally going to be like an endless blockbuster. Miles and miles and miles of movies the eye can see. And everything is going to be on the digital platform. And it's going to be wondrous and it's going to be vast. And you'll never need anything ever again. And that promise, sadly, never really came. Still hasn't to this day. And... There's something about owning a physical copy of a movie in your hand. There's something about owning it and having it that makes it feel more real, that makes it feel more lived in. And, you know, I can't say that I'm ever going to go back to VHS. Probably not. But there's something about VHS that I appreciate because it's the first format that I really got into as far as collecting is concerned. And it's the first format that I really fell in love with. And so there's always going to be something for me of a little bit of a, of a piece of my heart and nostalgia for the VHS generation. And so... You know, I I can't say that, you know, I'm going to go out of my way to have like 2,500 VHS tapes. It's wild. But, you know, I think that, you know, we have a lot of these companies pushing, you know, 4K and pushing digital and having us, you know, get the new stuff. But I think, you know, the the more people kind of force feed you stuff, the more you kind of want to rely on old school nostalgia, because there's something about it that feels comforting. It's it's like comfort food. It feels good to you, and you like it, and and it reminds you of better times. And so, I think VHS still holds a special place for a lot of people. It holds a special place for me. You know, and I can see why it still resonates for so many people to this day. Because one day, guys, I'm not going to lie to you. One day, maybe 20 years from now, 30 years from now, we're going to look back and we're going to say, oh my God, I miss the days of Blu-ray. I miss the days of, of DVD. And so, you know, we always think everything's going to be around for as long as, like, we live. And when it goes away, it's a sad moment. Well, you got to realize that nothing lasts forever. And you got to cherish what you have now. Because it could be gone before you know it. And so, VHS really truly means a lot for physical media lovers like myself. And people who still collect it because it's just, it reminds us of a great time that was lost long ago. May never come back, but we can always remember remember the good times. Just wanted to kind of share that with you guys. Thought it would be kind of, kind of fun. Definitely let me know what you guys think about that. And I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, definitely give it the thumbs up. And if you're new to the channel, welcome. Check out the other Blu-ray and DVD Tuesday videos that I've done. The movie hunting videos like Dollar Tree Hunts. Definitely check those out. 
live streams, Blu-ray pick videos, movie reviews with my friends, and much, much more. If you're a lover of movies and physical media, hit subscribe and become a part of the Film Fan Nation. I want to thank my really great subscribers out there. You guys are absolutely amazing. The great feedback, watching the videos, really anticipating what's coming on the channel. You guys really are the lifeblood, and you really keep this channel going, and I love the support. You give me the love, and I hope I give the love right back to you. Seriously, guys. So thank you. Be on the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank you so much. And keep up to date with everything I'm doing through Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. FilmFan108. Keep up to date with everything I'm doing, plus special pictures and videos I do from time to time on social media as well. All right, guys. I will see you back next week for a brand new Blu-ray and DVD out and about video. Take care, everybody, and happy hunting.